God bless you, Facebook and YouTube. How you doing? It's a Friday afternoon. This is Robert Jenkins out of New Orleans. We do apologize. We are a lot late today. I uh, try to be on time, but uh, wasn't able to do that today. But thank God anyway. It's Friday, and um, welcome to everybody to Divine Insight Ministries. We are on five days out of a week, Monday through Friday, 5.30 Central Time, Easter, 6.30 Eastern Standard Time. God bless you, Tracy. Uh, thank you, as always, for people who come on faithfully. You don't know how much it, it does in my heart to see people consistently wait for a word of God and come on. So you're a blessing to me. You keep me encouraged. I know that a lot of times you let me know that I encourage you. But by being faithful and coming on consistently, it encourages me. Uh, many times you wonder if people are really getting the truth. And you're wondering if they're being fed. And uh, when you show consistency, it kind of answers that question. So God bless you as always. Me and my wife, we love you. And uh, we just thank you for all that you do. Please go on YouTube and watch the videos. And you know we on Instagram as well. So we thank you for all that you're doing. We appreciate that. It is a Friday. We're going to do a part five today. A part five of uh, a prepared people for a prepared place. I do have a couple of announcements. First announcement is my wife's birthday is Sunday, March 4th. So please, uh, we, we won't be on this weekend. So send out a shout out to her and tell her happy birthday. Um, we won't tell you how old she is. She's still uh, young and looking beautiful as always. And uh, so do that. And we appreciate that. Her birthday is Sunday, March 4th. All right. So we're going to go into part five today. Um, dealing with a prepared people for a prepared place. And so we're just looking for God to do great things. Let's pray. Father, thank you already for blessings. We thank you already for your mercy and grace. We thank you in advance for healing and deliverance. As always, Holy Spirit, you teach us lead us into a place that we've never seen before in God. Grow us up into a place of maturity. And we bless your name for all that you're doing. Thank you in advance for your grace. Thank you in advance for healing. We ask angels to uh, assist us, north, east, south, and west. Protect the word. And God, we thank you in advance that you have been preparing us for this prepared place. And we thank you in advance. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want you to write down some things. I'm going to give you some things. And these are things that God just gave me in the last five minutes uh, on my way to start teaching here. He just gave me some things to give you. And then we're going to go to Exodus chapter 4, uh, verses 2 through 7. Okay, so we're going to come out of Exodus chapter 4. Good to see everybody. Everybody. Ruby Dixon, everybody. Just We just thank you so much. Exodus chapter 4, verses 2 through 7. I want to encourage you. I think there's a lot of things going on. I talked about there's a shift in the atmosphere. So I want you to stay encouraged and be consistent. You know, when I talked about New Year's Eve, I talked about how this is the this is the year that we're going to finish the work, that we're going to finish what God has started in our lives. So I want you to make sure you stay focused and do not get uh, distracted, but stay in stay in the vein, stay stay in the zone, and watch things manifest. They're constantly manifest. God is really preparing a place. This is just not a good message. It's a real message. And God is doing some things. So I'm excited. And remember, we can run this race with patience. So don't think always um, that you have to be over zealous about it. You can be at a content place and still be moving. Okay. The first thing I want to talk about today is that in preparing yourself or God is preparing you for this place, there's some things that God is going to train you how. Okay. And these are things he gave me like in the last five to seven minutes. He says, I'm teaching them how to know how to manage time, how to manage time. Okay, very good. I want you to hear that. Manage time. Good to see you, Dave. Manage time. Write that down. This training for this prepared place is teaching you how to manage time. When you are being elevated, when there is a promotion, when there are transitions, time is something you must know how to manage because you're going to have to do more for God. More in your ministry, more in your marriage, more in your finances. You have to do these things with the same 24 hours, seven days a week that you've always had. So you got to know how to manage your time. You have to know how to get quality out of little time. When you're young and immature, you'll take eight hours to do something that could take two hours because you don't know how to manage your time. And God is a God of order. So in all transitions, God will always have you revisit order. He'll have you revisit order so you can learn how to manage your time so that, so that God can add an increase to your life. 
Okay? God is going to add an increase to your life. So you have to know how to manage time. You have to know how to still give your wife a quality time and still do more in ministry. You got to know how to give your family quality time and still do more in ministry. So you got to know how to manage time. That's very key. And God is going to show you that. So this is the training, how to manage time, how to get things done faster, quicker, but still be effective. Okay? Faster and quicker, but still be effective. Very key. And most of the time, this has to do with having the aces in their places. Having people in the right place to do the right thing. People that are born to do things, they can get things done in a timely manner because they understand how to do them. They understand the function and the operation. So God is training you for a new place and he's training you how to manage your time because you're going to have an increase in your life. You have to be dedicated to more things and more people and you still have the same 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you might not sleep as much as you used to in managing your time. You may not uh, have as much um, uh, time in, in, let's say, uh, uh, extra activities. Still know how to have fun but know how to enjoy yourself in two hours versus 12, okay? Very key. So I want you to understand that. So this, when God, I talk about a prepared people, a prepared people have learned how to manage their time, learned how to put things in order, learned how to, the emphasis to, the, the uh, let me see, to um, distinguish between the majors and the minors, Okay, as you are transitioning, as you are being promoted, as you're being elevated, you will learn how to make the major majors and make the minors minors. And no longer minoring in the majors and majors in the minors. But you'll learn that, okay? So I'm giving you something. Even this teaching today is practical. It's practical. And this is how you grow. You have to learn how to manage your time. A lot of times in our promotion, we look for the emotional thrill that we have been getting from church. And I don't care how much you can shout and speak in tongues. And you know, I talk about church a lot because I was raised up in church. And most of my failures came from a religious mindset. But I'm telling you, as God promotes you on your business, or in your ministry, in your marriage, you're going to have to learn some practical things. How to manage your time because you can't lose your children to your ministry and you can't lose your your your, your ministry to your job you gotta know how to balance those out and when i'm talking about balance i'm not talking about the choice between evil and good i'm talking about the balance a righteous balance okay of giving things the proper time that they should have so in being prepared for this prepared place god's gonna teach you how to manage time okay the next thing God is going to teach you how to manage is how to manage your finances. There is an increase that's been released in the earth for the remnant, for the people that's God preparing. God will not elevate you and not elevate your finances. I told you every man should have four streams of income. God is going to reveal to you how to get back to those four streams of income. When Adam fell, he got kicked out of the garden. So our consciousness does not know how to enjoy itself or how to manage the finances that God originally has for us. So when we get back to God, we get back in his glory, then we find out that everything that he wanted us to have financially is in his glory. And as he increases that glory to you, he's also going to increase finances. But you have to know how to manage your finances. You can't waste the increase. You'll be surprised at how many times God has, has multiplied your money and you don't see no growth because you have no management. This is one of the things that I have a problem with tithes when we used to teach it the old way. And I'm going to do a, a teaching on the proper way of giving. Okay, But even when we taught tithes the improper way, the problem I had with it was is that most leaders would teach you how to pay 10% to the church or so-called pay it to God, which is really, it, it was wrong the way they interpret it. Uh, but the problem with that is, is that you can be faithful over 10, but you fail over your 90 because no one taught you proper stewardship. So if you don't have proper stewardship over your 90, even though God may be open up the window and pour you out a blessing, you don't have room to, to receive, your mismanagement would never let you see it anyway. See? So these are practical things that we need for this new place we're going, you can't waste the oil. You can't waste the finances. You can't waste the increase. You can't waste the seeds. Seeds set on a kitchen table will never bear forth fruit. So even though you can prophesy and you can say, look at all these seeds on the table. If you don't know how to manage those seeds and make sure those seeds get into ground, then they're waste. And we have wasted what God has blessed us. We have no abundance. 
We can't see it growing because we don't know how to manage the finances. Stewardship is so important to covenant. Stewardship is so important to government. And if you don't manage your money right, and you don't manage your time right, then you're not managing ministry right, and you're not ma managing marriage right. So God wants to add an increase, and going to this new place, you have to go with some principles. That's why I say a prepared people for a prepared place. You got to be prepared when God bless you with with, with multiplication and, and, and bless you with uh, replenishing. You got to know how to manage it. God is trusting you with more money, but you got to know how to manage it, and you can't waste it on yourself. Uh, and this is not a racist statement, what I'm about to say, but it's reality that most African-American people waste their money. We, we buy more potato chips than any other people in the world. We, we, we don't have a flat screen TV in our house, even if the lights are cut off. Talk to me, somebody. Oh, yeah, we're going to go to the rental center. We keep these companies alive because we don't know how to manage our money. We keep the candy stores alive. We keep the convenience stores alive because we don't know how to manage our money. And we will invest in things on the outside and don't know how to invest in real prosperity on the inside. We, 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 we will put on a $1,000 on our, on, on our body. Talk to me, somebody. We'll spend $80, $100 on the weave. Yes, we will. Yeah, we'll, we'll try to buy Rolex watches, men. We want to have the best tennis shoes, $100, $200, $300 tennis shoes. And then we feel like we're nothing. Come on, somebody. We'll buy brand new dresses for church, but we don't know how to manage our money. So even though we look, we look good on Sundays, our houses are raggedy. We need new screen doors. I'm talking to you, somebody. I'm preaching right now. And God wants to prepare you to a place, but he doesn't want to take you to a new place. And you don't know how to manage what he's about to bless you with. You don't know how to manage, you don't know how to manage this, this, this land thrown with milk and honey. Okay? Very key. So that's why he has to change our mindset, change the place, because you can't take the ghetto mindset to the suburbs because you'll park your car on the grass and make the property go down. Okay? Very key. So as you move and increase, you have to know how to manage. Okay? There's a different management for Mercedes Benz than it is for bicycles. Real talk. I'm talking to you and I'll give you practical things. And you have to understand that. And you may desire a Mercedes and God want to bless you with a Mercedes. But you understand the, the maintenance for a Mercedes? You understand that the, the headlights going to cost you so much money? You understand the price of a tune-up? And you don't buy a Mercedes Benz and park it in, or, or in the projects. Talk to me, somebody. Not 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 that that you you are beneath a Mercedes, but the Mercedes doesn't have the security in the projects. The crime rate is so much higher. You need a garage to protect you from the weather. All these different things that we need. And see, these are things that we don't want to hear sometimes. Sometimes we want to be so spiritual, but we know earthly good. And I hate that statement. But the truth of the matter is that God wants to bless you with the best. But do you know how to manage what God wants to give you? Even when it comes to oil. I talked about it yesterday. Jesus, I mean, God taught the woman through the Holy Ghost. God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Through the understanding of the Spirit of God, what to do? The prophet told her, look, you got to pour the oil. When you pour it, make sure you fill the glass up with oil and then put it to the side. And, when, and once all the vessels have been filled and you put it to the side, then you go sell the oil. That's management. And in that management, you will pay off your debts and your sons. And you won't have any financial burden anymore because I taught you how to manage the little oil that you have. Management. Very key. So a lot of people, and, and what the devil will do, I told you, when we're not obedient, we open up doors to the enemy. The Bible says rebellion is at the spirit of witchcraft. So anytime you rebel against the word from the Lord, anytime you rebel against the spirit, you open your door to witchcraft. And these demons and demonic spirits or thoughts will come into your life and rob you and make you be frustrated. And you'll be complaining to your husband, complaining to your wife, complaining to people. I don't have enough when you have more than enough. God has increased and increased and increased, but your lack of management, you can't see the blessings of God flowing in your life. You're wasting oil. You're wasting fruit. You can be wasting conversation. God taught me how to manage my conversation. That I, I cannot cast my pearls before a swine. That's management. Some of you talking to, it, it goes in one ear and out the other. You're, it, there's holes in their pocket. They don't hear the word of God. So you're wasting all the oil of ministering to all these people, and it's not going nowhere. So I have to learn, and I have to learn that because I love to preach, I love to teach. And my love for something could, co could cause me to be abusive. 
See, because you love the shop, you can buy too much. See, I used to, I, I love drums and I love playing the piano. And when I, I remember when I, God, I feel the Holy Ghost. When I used to give drum lessons, I would charge the people $7 for a half an hour of drum lessons. But I would teach for an hour and a half. Teach for an hour and a half. Why? I wasn't teaching for an hour and a half. I love playing drums. So we was enjoying one another at the expense of $7 and being pulled away from the marriage, being pulled away from studying because I'm letting my love cause me to mismanage. Ooh, some stuff you're not doing because the Holy Ghost led you. Some stuff you're not doing because of the move of the Spirit. Some stuff you're doing because you're allowing love to be abusive because you won't manage it. You have to know how to manage it. So when it comes to finances, especially when God want to move you to this new place, God want to trust you with, with millions, but you can't waste it. You can't put it in the wrong hands. You can't bless something that's already been cursed, and you can't curse something that's already been blessed. You have to be stewardship. Your job is to make sure that you're sowing on good ground. You have to be a ground inspector. A ground inspector. Try to spirit by the spirit and see if it's of God. And then replace the God that you may want to plant seeds don't mean don't mean God wants you to plant it. And a lot of times it don't come back right because you planted it in bad ground. So you're wondering that you're not reaping what you sow. And sometimes you will sow a curse because you sowed into a cursed ground. You ever gave money to somebody that God didn't tell you to give money to, and all of a sudden your money got funny? All of a sudden, your money got funny. You wonder, what's going on? I've never been this tight on financially because you gave to the wrong person. You ever gave to the right organization or the right person? God told you to sow, and ever since then, it, it creates a flow because this is proper management. There's stewardship. When God gave the gifts out, the talents, which is really referring to money, he gave one person one, one person five, and one person ten. Management knew how to invest. So the person who had ten, he invested, and he had twenty. So when Jesus came back for the return on it, he had a return because he invested it because he knew how to manage. In this new place, God wants you to take the skills that he's trained you to take into this new place. God has trained you how to manage even the little money. I told you I was raised up on welfare. I was raised up on Section 8. And that was the training mechanism. So when I give you millions, you know how to work with it because you work with hundreds. You work with 20s and 30s. I remember doing ministry for a church five days out of a week. I taught twice every day, and that church was paying me $20 a week. I remember that. Preaching like I'm preaching right now. And they would literally give me $20 every Friday. And I would preach every Monday morning, every Monday afternoon. Every Tuesday morning, every Tuesday afternoon. Every day of the week, I would teach. But God was teaching me how to manage $20 a week. You understand that? So when God is about to take me, and I know God is about to take me into millions. You know why? Because I'm called to sow millions into some of y'all lives. There are people that God has put on my heart to sow millions into your ministry. To so millions. To literally come to your city and help establish your, your business. See, I'm called to do that. I know I'm called to do that. I'm called to set up a team. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Called to set up a team. Come and sow. And here's the building. We're going to pay your rent for the first two years so you can do what God called you to do. See, so I know that God has been training me for millions because I, I have millions that I have to pour into the vessel. There's oil I have to pour into the vessel. So I have to learn how to manage. So when I go to that next place and now I'm a blessing to you, I'm not asking you to bless me. I am a blessing, but I only can be a blessing because I've been blessed. Ooh, what are you talking? But management is so important and God wants to trust you, but you don't know how to manage the people you have. You talk to the two people you have, nasty. You got to manage your words. You can't just say anything to come to your mind. You have to be careful what comes off your mouth. See, you nasty to the two employees. You don't treat your husband right now. You don't treat your wife right now. Why would God trust you with other souls when the ones that he trusts that's tied to your blood system, there's not a level of godly respect, okay? So management is so important. So not only management with time, but management with finances. And I'm telling you that God has been preparing you. So don't act like you need to be prepared. Just learn the lessons from the journey that you're in right now, okay? For the journey that you're in right now. And have good stewardship and learn how to do that and learn how to trust God. And when God says, put it away, put it away. When God says, give it, then give it. In all that ways, acknowledge him and let him direct our path. It's not your money. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the kingdom. You are part of the kingdom. You work in the kingdom so you can be a blessing to the kingdom. 
very key. So we have to know how to manage our time. We have to know how to manage our money. We have to know how to manage our words. The Bible says, let your words be seasoned with salt. You got to be careful of how you talk, how to be seasoned with salt. Very key. He says, be quick to hear and slow to speak. Some of you are quick to speak and are quick to speak and slow to hear. But he says, be quick to hear, not slow to hear. No, have your ears wide open. Take your time. Listen to the whole conversation. Hear the heart of the matter before you release these words. Why? Because out of your tongue, out of your tongue flows the issues of life. Also, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Life and death is not in the tongue. The power, the authority of it, it refers to a judge. And you can murder people because you didn't manage your words. You can curse your next new place because you didn't manage your word. You can curse, curse your marriage because you didn't manage your words. Okay? So management is so important. So we must manage uh, time. We must manage our finances. We must manage our words. And there's many other things we must manage. We got to manage our emotions. You cannot allow these winds to toss you to and fro. You have to know how to manage your emotions. Your emotions will take you all over the place. Your emotions will have you like the apostles, and you'll be saying to Jesus, don't you care that we perish? I'm on board. I'm the one told y'all to cross over to the other side. But because you can't manage your emotion, every little thing has you going off. Every little thing has you doubting. Every little thing has you depressed. Every little thing, you have to learn to manage your emotions. Your emotions are part of you. And God is not telling you to deny your emotions. You know how I know that? Because he says, be angry, but sin not. Anger is an emotion. He tells you not to deny your emotion. Be angry, but sin not. Don't allow your anger to take you into a sin. Don't allow your emotions to move you to trespass against the law. Sin is a transgression against the law. So you have to manage your emotion. This is something that I practice constantly. How to be able to stay a gentleman. How to be able to hear words that normally would cause me to walk into offense. Words that would normally cause me to go off. And literally harness those feelings, feel those feelings, and then apply truth to those feelings. Try Really apply truth to the heart of the person that's saying these words. Because if I don't read their hearts, I'm going to miss what they're saying. This is so important. So I got to manage my time because it belongs to God. I have to manage my finances because it belongs to God. I have to manage the words because these are the words of God. The power of life and death is in the tongue. And I have to manage my emotions because I can't let the devil think that he can cause me to react. And now all the training that God has did for me to move into my next place, I missed it because I couldn't manage it. Oh, this is crazy right here. This is good stuff. Okay, so let's go to, uh, I don't want to hold you alone today. I want to encourage you. Be encouraged. Don't quit. Uh, I went over a song today I wrote years ago. I got a chance to record it. I wanted to play it today, but I'm not. I still got some things I got to finish it. But the song simply says, don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. And I want to encourage you. I understand. I am transparent. I have been there. I have suffered. But I'm telling you, all of this is preparation for the new place. God is literally preparing the people for a prepared place. And you better believe, I don't care how bad it looks, you are being prepared for this place. And not only that, but God is preparing a place for you. A lot of times you'll go look for apartment and you'll go to ISA living, uh, uh, what they call apartment complexes. And you know, and the lady would say, well, you got to come back Friday and see the place before you move in because we have to prepare the place for you. I've already put my money down on it. My credit has already been approved to move into place, but they have to prepare the place for me. There was a tenant in there before uh, before I got the lease to this new place. And they're going to go in there and they're going to repaint the walls. They're going to put down a fresh uh, carpet. They're going to prepare the place for me. Now, I, I have to have myself prepared that I can pay the note and I can get the washer and dryer and that I have some dishes to move in. So I'm preparing myself to move into a new neighborhood. But also, while I'm preparing myself to move into this new place, the place is being prepared for me. Oh, so I'm telling you, God is preparing a place for you. And in that preparation, in this time of journey, in your preparation, God is saying, I've been training you how to manage your money how to manage your time, how to manage your word, and how to manage your emotions. Let's go to uh, Exodus chapter 4. All right? God bless everybody. If you just coming on, if you have not hit that share button, just take a couple seconds and hit that share button. Go ahead and hit it and share it on your page. Okay? Hit it and share it on your page. 
want to be a blessing. If you have not watched uh, sessions one, two, three, and four, go back because we've been talking a lot about being a prepared people for a prepared place, okay? Thank you and God bless you. Don't forget now, this Sunday, uh, and I'm, I'm announcing it because there's so much love that you're giving, and I don't, want, I don't want to feel like that we have excluded you. So my wife's birthday is this Sunday, March 4th. Remember to tell her happy birthday, okay? Because I feel like you're a family, and you should know that as well. Uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse 1 says this. And Moses answered and said, But behold, thou wilt not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord has appeared, has not appeared unto me. Point one out of this text is that when God is preparing you for a mission, and when God is preparing you for ministry, when God is preparing you for marriage, a lot of times you still have doubts that you're going to be accepted. Moses was concerned that if I go and tell Pharaoh, God said, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go so that they could serve me. Moses' response to that was, that behold, they will not believe me. And a lot of times when God is preparing you, he's preparing you to get your belief together. You're not confident enough that they're going to receive you. And God, in this chapter, I'm going to teach you a lot how God is building your confidence. A lot of times while you have not moved into, into your transition yet, or this place that God has been preparing you because he's been trying to get you together to quit doubting who you are. So to deal with Moses, and this is a normal thing. This is a normal thing that a lot of times we are not fully persuaded of who we are in God. Okay, this is a reality. So when you read the text, I want you to see, not just read where Moses were, but read where you are as well. Good to see you, James. God bless you, my man. Love you so much. This is so important. So God is telling Moses, say, look, I hear you, Lord. I hear you talking out of this bush. I hear you. I see this fire. I see. I hear the voice coming out. You told me to take off the shoes, but now you're telling me to go back to the enemy's camp, and you're telling me to tell him to let the people go who's been under bondage for 400 years. I don't believe they will believe me. See? I don't think they will hear me. And there's times that God is preparing your belief, your belief to be at a greater level. And all of us have different levels of belief. Some people can believe God, that they can hear God one time and walk straight out the boat and, and just follow Jesus. There's some people who have to say, Lord, is that you? I'm not sure. And if it is, bid me to come. There's other people have to be like Moses and say, I don't think they will believe me. But the key thing is, God is training you to build your belief system. So this right here, I love the honesty of Moses. I don't think they will believe me. And many times we are in places where I don't think people will believe me. I would love to go to the crack house, love to go to the gangs, love to start a church, love to start the ministry. But a lot of times your concern is, will they believe me? I want to tell them the truth. I want to give them what you told me to give them. I have the answers. I heard what you said. But do I really believe they will believe me. Okay? All right. So important. So it says, and Moses says, it says, but behold, they will not believe me. Now, this is a preparation that God is about to build Moses' belief system. I speak this prophetically into your life, that God is building your belief system. You're so close to starting something new. You're so close to giving birth to this baby. You're so close to moving into a greater intimacy in your marriage. You're so close to moving into a greater level of writing these books and releasing these songs and, and opening up that bank that God told you and opening up that school that God told you and start that get dance career, all those different things to go and ask for promotion. But God is building your belief system because sometimes you don't believe that people will believe you. And a lot of times this could be based upon your past. I don't know if Moses was struggling with, look, I left as a fugitive. The last time they saw me, I had killed somebody. And sometimes we don't believe people will believe us because they have become too familiar with us. And sometimes it's hard for us to believe that people who know our past and our ugliness and, and, and our failures and they know our shortcomings and they know our proclivities, it's hard for us sometimes to believe you're going to send me to them because I, I, I don't think they're going to accept me. Uh, I, I don't I don't know if I go back home to Youngstown where well, they will embrace me like they embrace me in other cities. And sometimes we have that fear. And it's a reality. I don't think they will believe me. I ran away. I look like a coward. 
The last time they saw me, I was a runaway. I was a traitor. I was acting like I was Pharaoh's sons when I wasn't. I was acting like I wasn't a Hebrew when I was. And I didn't do everything right when I was in Pharaoh's place. And you're sending me back to a place. You're sending me back to a place that I, I, I wasn't in God like I am now. I wasn't, I wasn't as scripturally sound as I am now. You sent me back to a place that I made some negotiations that wasn't right. So it questions. And I'm telling you, God is not going to send you to the prepared place without preparing, without preparing and repairing your belief. Some of you, you need your belief to be repaired. It's been wounded. It's been wounded because of, of darts. It's been wounded because of, 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 of say-sayers. It's been wounded because of liars and, and rejection. But God is not only, uh, 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 he's, he's repairing and he's preparing your belief. So he says, I don't think they will believe me. Nor hearken to my voice. They won't believe me. And if I talk, they're not going to hearken to my voice. They're not going to do what I say. They're not going to believe that you are with me. They're not going to believe what he says. For they will say, the Lord has not appeared unto me. We have to overcome in order to move into this prepared place. we got to overcome thinking that people will not believe that I really have God's favor on my life. That I am a prophet. That I am an apostle. That I am a evangelist or a pastor or a teacher. They're not going to believe that God told me to say this. They're not going to believe that God told me to come and really set the people free that's in the church. If I go to these leaders and tell them, God said, let them go, the leaders are not going to hear me. Sometimes we're afraid to talk to our pastor. We're afraid to talk to our best friend. We're afraid to talk to my mama or my daddy. Because they're not going to believe that God told me you're doing some things wrong. And God wants you to let the people go. God wants you to stop robbing the people. He wants you to stop manip uh, manipulating the people. They're not going to believe it. And sometimes it's not that they're not going to believe it. you got to go and believe that God says, do what I say. Don't worry about the result. I want you to be obedient. So God is building your belief that if I sent you, that's all that matters. Right? You're right, Sister Betty. Wounded by some of the same people God is sending me right back to. And God is building your belief. I'll send you right back to the drug addicts. And I know you think they're going to laugh at you. How are you going to preach to me, girl? We used to get high so much. You're sending you right back to the playboys and the pimps. And they're going to say, man, get on out of here. All the women you used to pimp. Send me right back to the grain leaders. Man, all the people we didn't beat up together. All the drugs we didn't sold. All the weed we did. All the women we've been with. Come on. Okay? And God is building our belief system. Why? Because this is preparation. Brother James said, I went through everything you just said, and I had no choice but to completely trust in him. And that's what God is doing. He's building our trust. He's building that you go because I'm with you. And watch this. There's some powerful revelation that God wants to reveal to us today from this text. Watch this. So he has three doubts. He has a doubt that they will believe him. God, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna learn something today that God was building your belief about how the people feel about you. He didn't believe they would hear his voice. God is building the confidence in your voice. You are a voice to the nation. You are a voice to men. You are a voice to women. You are a voice on your job. You are a voice to your children. You are a voice in your home. You are a voice in your community. I am preparing you to be confident in a belief system and the voice that I am speaking through you. And he says, I'm building that they may, may feel like or they may not believe that you have appeared to me. I'm building confidence that you really heard from God, that God is really backing you up. And I've seen this in my life. I've seen God endorse his name on me. And with people who used to question me. Okay, this is one of the things that the devil tries to do. Man, I just feel the spirit of teaching. This is such a powerful clip. I can just feel the Holy Ghost teaching us today. Uh, one of the things the devil tries to do, he tries to mess up your credibility. Your credibility. Because most of the time in the world, when your credibility has been damaged, it doesn't matter how much ability you have. And the worldly mindset will ignore your ability because you're not trustworthy.
because you have no credibility. This is why people, superstars, when they get caught in scandals and different things like that, you notice that the endorsements fall. The endorsements fall because you're not credible anymore. Okay? Very key. So they try to ruin your credibility. This is one of the things, and I don't want to go into this a long time, but I'll hit it and then I'll move on. It's one of the things that Monique is dis is discussing. She was saying that when she was supposed to do go to Disney uh, to back up one of the movies she was in, and, and they want her to do it for free, which that's a normal thing that they do, uh, but it wasn't a contractual thing. Uh, when she didn't do it, she said that Tyler Perry and, and, and Oprah Winfrey and I, I guess this other guy, Lee Dan, Daniels, uh, they boycotted her in a sense or blackballed her and now they said they marked her to the point she's not credible so they put it out that she's hard to work with and what happens is it hurt her credibility that other people would not hire her or would not endorse her so it hurt her finance now it did not hurt her ability she still had the ability to act she still had the ability to tell jokes but because of her credibility had been damaged then now her ability was no longer being accepted. This is a major thing that the world does, and this is a major thing that the devil does. This is why the devil loves to bring up people's past. Because if I tell you he's been married this many times, he got this many babies, he got caught in this sexual act, he got caught doing this, he's a liar, he did this, even though it could have been five years ago, three years ago, six years ago, six months ago, people will not trust you, will not trust your ability, because your credibility has been marked. This is why if you get a car loan and you miss so many payments, they'll come take the car and they hard for you to get another car loan because your credit, your credit has been damaged because of lack of faithfulness or a lack of loyalty or lack of commitment or lack of consistency. See? So, so now you can't go to a higher place, you can't get a better car, you can't get another house because your credit, the devil masters showing people your past. So even though you have the ability to bless them, even though you have the ability to help them, even though you have the ability to bring them out of bondage, if they hold on to your past, it hurts your credibility. Moses was concerned about his credibility. Even though he knew that God had spoke to them, but I don't think they will hear me. And this is a major thing. This is why we got to take people away from the cross because we always want to take them back to what they did and yesterday and the day before. And what happens is the law will always show you you're not credible. Grace will always show you that you are credible because grace empowers you to do what God called you to do in spite of your past, in spite of you being a killer, Paul, a Saul, I can use you in Paul. Even though, Peter, you lied, I can use you to the day of Pentecost. Grace comes to empower you, but the law will always show that you are not credible and we should not use you and it takes you back to the place of death. Okay? Very key. In many times in marriage, the wife can't get past the, the last bad credit. Your husband, did he missed on the payment. He missed on doing what he said he's going to do. And because of that, some marriages can't become whole. It's hard for us to turn the water into wine because we don't trust the water to be turned into wine. And when credibility has been hurt, then what happens is the trust is messed up. And the bad thing about trust, trust Trust is like betrayal, okay? Trust is like betrayal. And this is why women have a hard time overcoming being portrayed. Because whenever you have a trust issue, you can't. it's hard to reconcile without the power of forgiveness because people who have a trust issue, they don't trust trust. They don't trust trust. They want to trust you, but they don't trust trust to trust you with. I don't trust what I need to trust you with. So people say, I don't, I'll never trust again. Now it's no longer about you. It's about the spirit of trust that I will not take my hands off. So I'll control. And this is how Jezebel come in and control these spirits come in because there is no, there is no trust issue. So Moses was concerned, but I'm, I'm telling you this because I don't want you to be a victim. Good to see you, Sam. I don't want you to be a victim of not being able to move into your new place because your old place keeps ruining your credit. Okay? This is why you have to have a new credit report. Because you you got to go back what God says about me and not what man knows about me. Write this down. 
You can't go by what you got to go by what God says about me and not what man knows about me. Because what man knows about me will discredit me. But what God says about me makes me have the availability. So I may not be credible, but I am, I have the ability. See, credibility says my credit is not able, but ability says I can still do it, okay? Very key. That's why I told you. Monique can still tell jokes. Monique can still act, but they hurt her credibility that nobody trusts her ability. When Moses is talking to God, he knows that there's a new assignment on my life. God has prepared me. I'm a new individual, but he was concerned about, do they still see me the old way? Do they still know me by my old pair of shoes? This is the reason why God said the place where you stand, take off your shoes. Because your shoes will discredit you. Your shoes got old murderer. Your shoes got the spirit of adultery on it. Your old shoes got fornication on it. But the new shoes, the holy ground in which you stand right now, has my ability on your life. So these are very good questions. So he says, God, I hear you. I want to go back and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. But I'm concerned. I don't know if they're going to believe me when I walk in. So I'm telling you right now, God is building your belief about how they believe about you. Did you hear that? God is changing the people's minds about how they used to not believe you. Because God is working on the belief systems in your life. And you're going to be able to walk in that room with confidence Knowing that this will come to pass because God has built my belief. The second thing he says, I don't know if they're going to hearken to my voice. God is repairing and preparing your voice to be heard. God, I feel like, man, I feel like shouting. God is building your, your voice that when you speak, they will listen. When you walk into the room, they're going to be quiet because God is building your voice. The confidence that your voice and God's voice have become one. The last thing he said is, I don't know if they will believe that you have appeared before me. God is going to show the world and the nations that my presence is on his name. Oh, my presence is on his words. And when you walk into this prepared place, it's going to be like doors at an airport. Before you get two feet in front of the door, it's going to swing open. You're not going to have to push it and make sure. You're not going to have to unlock it. You're not going to need no key. It's been waiting for you to arrive at this new place. And when you have allowed God to prepare you, when you get close enough to the door, it's going to open for you. Oh, watch this. Because God is training me for this new place. It's going to open up like the Red Sea. Watch this. Okay, if you're just coming on, hit that share button. Hit that share button. We are, we are in Exodus chapter 4. We are in verse 2. Moses tells God all of his reasonings that's delaying his move. I don't know if I should move because they may not believe me. They may not hearken to my voice. And they won't believe that you have appeared before me. Watch how God responds to the wrong answers. I love the way God responds to the wrong answer. It's the same thing with the with the widow yesterday. She says, you know, she says, uh, look, I, I, I'm in some debt. I need my debt to be paid. I have two sons. My daddy, I mean, my, my husband's dead. And the next thing the prophet says, what do you want me to do for you? And then next verse he says, what's in the house? Before she get a chance to answer the question, he already points to the solution. Did you hear that? Before you're going to get a chance to tell God your reasoning, he's going to point to the solution. Moses tells God all this, and watch what God says to Moses in verse 2. And the Lord said unto him, what's in your hand? Now, yesterday I talked about what's in your house. Now I'm talking about what's in your hand. Okay? When we deal with the woman, the question was, what's in the house? When you deal with the church, God wants to know what's in the house. But when you deal with the apostolic fathers... To the man, God want to know what's in your hand. When you're dealing with the apostolic and the prophetic, it's what's in your hand. When you're dealing with the church, which is a her, then you're dealing with what's in the house. We have to know how to look in the house and find the oil, and we have to know how to look in the man's hand and find what's in there. When you're dealing with men of God, you have to know what's in their hand. He said, I have all power. Jesus said, I have all power in my hand. 
Oh, you got to know what's in the hand. So when you're looking at a man of God, you have to know what's in the hand. When you're looking at God's divine kingdom, you have to know what's in the house. Watch this. Okay? I'm trying to tell you something. David had a slingshot where? In his hand. Moses had a rod where? In his hand. Okay? But when the, when the widow, he said, what's in the house? You got to know what's in your hand and what's in the house. Watch this. And the Lord said, what's in your hand? He said, a rod. A rod. When you see the movies, you see a rod. And, and, and according to Psalms 23, a rod and a staff is the same thing. The rod is the, is the is, when you turn the staff over, that's the, the straight end of it. So you can chastise a child with a rod. But the staff, can take, you can put it around the sheep neck and pull the sheep out of trouble. So the rod and the staff, they should cover me, which is really one piece. Okay, so Moses has this rod or this staff, and God says to him, what's in your hand? I know I told you to go someplace, and you don't think, watch this, you don't think they will believe you? You don't think that they will hearken to your voice? You don't think that they think I have appeared? But you have something in your hand that's going to handle their unbelief. What's in your hand going to stop their unbelief? What's in your hand is going to cause them to hearken to your voice? And what's in your hand is going to reveal that I am with you? Oh, do you know that God has put something in your hand? God has put something in your mouth. God has put something on your feet that will reveal to the people that they must believe that you are, are, are God. They must hearken to your voice because you know that God has endorsed what's in your hand. God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Watch this. And the Lord said to him, what is in thy hand? He said, a rod. He said, cast it on the ground. Now, this rod, and I told you now, we want, we want to get some revelation here. So we're dealing with the rod and the staff. So Moses has a staff in his hand. I'm telling you, every great man of God, every great woman of God, whenever God sends you, he'll send you with a staff. He'll send you with a rod. He'll send you with something that brings chastisement or correction, and he'll send you with something to support. But you got to know how to manage what's in your hand. I told you, whenever you are transitioning to a blessed place, whenever you are transitioning to a blessed place, God will teach you how to manage time, how to manage money, how to manage the word in your mouth, and how to manage your emotions. Now he's teaching them how to manage what's in his hand. What's on the hand. The hand represents five, right? The five-fold ministry. Hands, five-fold ministry. Oh, you better understand. Five represents grace. And whenever you see the grace of God, you see the five-fold ministry. What did David have? A slingshot in his hand. How many stones did he have? Five. Oh, you must understand the five-fold ministry, the completion of God. He said, what's in your hand? A staff. Now watch how he teaches him how to handle the staff. He said, cast it on the ground. Woo! Watch this. Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground. And it became a serpent. And Moses fled before it. Watch this. Moses, I'm preparing you for a prepared place. The place that you have to go that's prepared, you've been trained all your life to go and set these people free. I hope I'm blessing you today. I don't care how much people think you're not going to get there. You've been trained to get to your next level of success. You've been trained to handle millions. You've been trained to speak to nations. You've been trained to own your own bank. You've been trained to run your own boot camp. I'm telling you, and God going to show you that you have been trained all your life for this reason. Now God is weeding out. The last things that need to be weeded out of Moses' life. So he said, cast the rod in your hand. When he casts it on the ground, he noticed that the thing that was in his hand that brought him no harm, that brought him no sickness, that brought him no trouble, when he released it, it turned into a serpent. We are being trained how to handle situations that it, it, when it is in your hand. When these children are in your hand, when this marriage is under God's protection, under the fivefold ministry, under the anointing, it looked like a great staff. But when you release it, it turns into a serpent. Oh, you better listen here. It, it's a snake 
when it's not in the right hands. It's a snake when it's not under the right anointing. It's a snake when it hasn't had the fivefold ministry. It's a snake without the grace of God being on it. And when Moses saw it, you have to realize Moses had some fears about men. One of Moses' strongest uh, weaknesses was that he feared what men would do unto him. This is one of the reasons why he had a problem with the people. Because he feared people's opinion. He always concerned about how people saw him and how they believed about him and all these different things. So God is trying to deal with his fears. So when he see the very thing that he's close to, that he leans on, that, that he trusts in, when it's in his, not in his hands, it turns to a snake and he runs. He's running again. God is trying to teach him, you're not going to have to run. You're not going to have to run. I'm going to show you how to deal with your fears. I'm going to show you how to deal with serpents. I'm going to show you how to deal with, 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 with being talked about and lied on. I'm going to show you how to deal with offense. I'm going to show you. And how do you deal with it? You don't have to run. I'm going to show you how to pick it up. Now, the revelation is, is that you didn't fear it when it was a staff. You didn't fear when they told you they love you. You didn't fear them when they supported you. You didn't fear them when they blessed you financially. Why are you afraid when you release them? You got to know the real character inside of all your staff members. You have to know the real issues that are inside of your husband. You got to know the real issues that are inside of your wife. You have to know the other side of your children when they're not in your hand. And you can't be afraid of your staff. Ooh, your staff is what's going to change the other people's belief. You need your staff. You just got to learn how to pick it up. I'm training you so when you go to the next place, you won't run every time you see a snake. You won't run every time they lie on you. You won't run every time they talk about you. You won't run every time they reject you. I'm going to teach you how to pick up snakes and turn snakes back into staffs. Woo! Turn, turn homeless people back into wealthy people. Turn the homosexuals and lesbians back into women and men of God. You got to be taught for this new place how to pick them up. Watch this. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost. And the Lord said to Moses, put forth the hand and take it by the tail. Ooh, take it by the tail. I can preach so much if you did a study on snakes and their tail. He said, take it by the tail. Don't grab it by the head. Grab it by the tail. When you're dealing with snakes, you have to grab them at the end. You have to see where they need to go and grab them by the conclusion of the matter. He said, don't pick it up by the head because if you pick it up by the head, it's going to bite you. you got to know how to be, what's this, wise as a serpent but harmless as the dove. You got to know how to pick them up without them knowing what's going on. You got to know how to pick them up without them knowing you interceding for them. You got to know how to pick them up without them knowing you praying for them. You got to know how to pick them up without them knowing the way the eyes are, they won't be able to see what's behind them. I'm going to teach you how to use people that would normally, if they saw you, they would talk about you, put you down, cut you, stab you, come against you, pr try to come, try to curse your marriage, try to curse your ministry. Oh, they're jealous, they envy, but I'm going to teach you how to pick them up by the tail. Why? Because you need them as staff members. You need that fight that's in that snake that when it's time to release him, he's going to be able to eat up the other snakes. There's some people that God going to send you that they were gangbangers, they was killers, but you know how to pick them up by the tail. Oh, there's some people that, that, you, that God going to send you, there ain't nobody to play with, but you're going to pick them up by the tail. And then when you pick them up by the tail, they're in your hand, they become a stab. They become gentle. They don't fight back. They don't bite. And whenever it's time to release them for battle, they know how to go and use the principle of the snake. Watch this. He said to Moses, put forth thy hand. You, you got to use your hand, Moses. You got to know how to use the fivefold ministry when it comes to snakes. You have to know how to use apostolic and prophetic and, and evangelists and pastors and teachers when it comes to the snake. Because it wasn't a snake until you released it. 
If you get upset because they bit you, it's because you released them without purpose. You only put this snake down on the ground when you need to battle other snakes. Moses, this very thing that's in your hand going to open up a Red Sea. This very thing that's in your hand going to turn that water into blood. That very thing that's in your hand is going to release every curse that I put on Pharaoh's house. And you got to know that even though it works for the Red Sea, if it wouldn't have been in the hand of God, they would have been snakes. They would have been liars. They would have been fornicators. They would have been adulterers. They would have been thieves. They would have been murderers. I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you with snakes. I mean staffs with rods. Woo! And you got to know how to put it in the right hand. You got to know how to put it in grace. You got to know how to put it in grace. You got to know how to put it in grace. You have to know how to put it in the apostolic and the prophetic and under the advantage of the pastor's teacher's anointing. You got to know how to put it in the book of Acts, the fifth book of the New Testament. You got to understand how to do it. You got to know how to put the rocks in the slingshot so you can kill Goliath. You got to know how to use the rock. You got to know how to use the staff. You got to know how to use what's in your hand. And I've been training you for this next place. Watch this. He says, pick it up. Pick it up by the tail. Now, what I love about Moses is Moses was obedient. Moses, stretch forth thy hand. I'm, I release right now the anointing that everything that God has extended to you, everything that God has connected to you, everything that God has promised you, I want you to extend your hand out now and say, Lord, I receive it. There's some, there, there's some, there, there, there is some snakes that if you put them in your hand, they're turning to millions of dollars. There's some snakes that if you put them, if you put your hand to it, it turns into blessings. It turns into multiplication. Woo! But you got to extend your hand. You have to extend your hand to the thing you used to be afraid of. You have to extend your hand to the thing you used to fear. You have to extend your hand to the thing you thought you could never conquer. You have to extend your hand. And when you touch it by the tail, by the end, God declares the beginning from the end. When you declare it from the end, it will turn back into your support. It will turn back into your help. Some things you don't have to run from. You running from it because you didn't know how to pick it up. You running from it because you did not know how to pick it up. How do I pick it up? How it looks dangerous. Normally, I run from marriages. Normally, I run from position. Normally, I run from opposition. No, normally, I run from enemies. Normally, I run from trouble. Normally, I run, but now I know how to take what I used to run from and make it work for me. I know how to use my staff, my secretaries, my administrators. I know how to use my staff, my deacons, my trustees. I know how to use my staff. My own my best. I know how to use my staff because I finally know how to pick them up. I know how to handle persecution. Why? Because I've been trained for a new place. And I can't take the fears. I can't walk up in Pharaoh's house. I can't walk up in that negotiation. I can't walk up in that bank. I can't walk up in that job if I'm afraid of their faces. You're right, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. We got to extend your hand. You have to extend the grace of God, the grace. The, you've been graced to do this. You've been graced to run these companies. You've been graced to overcome. You've been graced to walk up. You've been graced. Oh, you've been graced to lay hands on the sick. You've been graced to open up the blinded eyes. You've been graced to preach all over the world. You've been graced to do it. <laughs> Watch this. And the Lord said to Moses, put forth thy hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and he caught it. And it became a rod in his hand. Quit judging it for how it looks on the ground. You got to see it how it will look in your hand. Don't judge it from on the ground. On the ground, they look like they're no good. On the ground, they look like they cannot help you. On the ground, they look like they're, they are your worst enemies. On the ground, it looks like this marriage is impossible. But you got to see it back into the hands of God, back into the hands of grace, back into the hands of the fivefold ministry, back into the hands of the one that's been prepared 
to use you. God is preparing people to know how to handle you. They know how to support you. They know how to no longer disqualify you because you have the ability to be a blessing if they just knew how to pick you up. See? See? The devil wants to show you as a snake. God wants to reveal you as a rod. The devil wants to reveal you as weak. God wants to reveal you as strong. The devil wants to reveal you as uncontrollable. God wants to reveal you as, as knowing how to be led by the Spirit. Ooh. Watch this. He says, now watch, now watch this. And it, and it became around his hands. He says, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared unto them. He said, they don't know when they see this, that the same God that was the God of their fathers, you're not following some new religion. You're not following some new denomination. You're not following some new uh, philosophies. You're following the same God that was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm going to show you just like I was with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I shall be with you, Moses. They going to know because signs and wonders shall follow you. And these signs shall follow them that believe. There's some signs that God has put in your hand. Woo! That's going to reveal to people. Okay, watch this. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob shall appear to them. And, let's, and the Lord said, furthermore unto him, now put thy hand in thy bosom. He said, I'm going to even give you some more. You like that one? Let me give you some more. Let me bless you so you won't be taken to this new place. Worried about people believing you and worried about people hearing your voice and worried about people wonder, is he still with God? Is he really with God? Last time I know, he left the city. Last time I know, he left his ex-wife. The last time I know, he quit the job. Let me certify your arrival. You about to go to a new place and I'm going to give you something to let the people know you're supposed to be there. Woo! I'm telling you, I hear that in the spirit. Somebody, you are three days away. You are three days away from a meeting. Uh oh. Monday morning, you got a serious thing you have to meet. Monday morning, some of you got to make some major decisions. And when you go to that place, Monday morning, that prepared place for you, God has already given you a sign, a token, a rainbow that reveals to them that this is a move of God. When I was growing up, they would say, "Pray for a sign." If you want to know what should you do. He says, furthermore, God, I feel the Holy Ghost. You know, we'll pick up on that because oh, I just feel the move. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Mm. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. The next verse simply says this. Moses, take your hand, put it in, put it, put it into your bosom. Take it out. When he took it out of his leprosy, he was showing him that the hand has to be connected to the heart of God. And when your hand is not connected to the heart, if you look at your hand, if you ever take this grace, if you ever take the hand that I've given you, if you ever take your ministry and your ministry is not tied to love, it's not tied to me, then the very thing that should hold the rod will turn to leprosy. If, if ever the hand of God is not connected to the heart of God, it's leprosy. A lot of ministries have turned into leprosy because the hand was no longer connected to the heart. So he says, stick your hand in your bosom. And if you stick it in flesh bosom, if you stick it into the wrong place, when you look at it, it won't be able to operate the rod because it turned leprosy. It'll be cursed. So the hand was never designed to be outside of the heart of God. So whenever it's not in the house of God, the very thing that should help other people, the very person is supposed to help the staff, now he's cursed. Now the bishop is cursed. Now the apostle is cursed because the hand is not connected to the heart. So it says, stick it in the bosom, put it out. That's leprosy. See that? It's leprosy without my heart, without the way I love, without the way I forgive, without the way I move. You can't use this hand for your own good. You can't use this rod to make money. You can't use this ministry to profit. You can't use this ministry to build you million dollar houses and cars and everybody else catching the bus. But if you use this hand for the right reason, put it back in your bosom, it'll be the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be a hand. It ain't supposed to be leprosy. It's supposed to be a blessing and not a curse. It's supposed to be well and not sick. But it has to stay connected to the heart of God. 
Father, we bless your name for this calling. We thank you for this clarity. We thank you, Lord, that you are preparing us for a place, that you're preparing the place for us. We love you and we thank you for teaching us how to pick up our staff, how to pick it up regardless of how wild and crazy it looks. How to move into this financial blessing. Thank you, Lord, that you teach us how to manage our time and how to manage our money. How to manage our emotions and how to manage the word. Bless you. Bless your people everywhere. Touch them. And thank you, Lord, that when you come, we know we shall be like you. I have not seen and ears have not heard what you have prepared for the people of God. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we thank you and we bless you. Amen. God bless you. I want you to enjoy your weekend. Please take out the time. Hit that share button. Share this teaching. Powerful teaching today. I was blessed. God was talking to me while I was talking to you. Thank you. We love you. Enjoy your weekend. And don't forget to tell my wife happy birthday. Her birthday is March 4th this Sunday. We won't be on here. So I want you to take out the time and tell her happy birthday. Don't forget that. We love you. God bless you. Enjoy your weekend. And remember this. You've been prepared for this blessed place.